uh, when the plantation was put into place. Uh, and so even our indust industry partners and all, at least in Oregon, I'm sure up in here as well, will buy into this idea of viewing fire as a time and space thing at the landscape scale. They can come into the discussions and the planning as well. Uh, they're not going to want to be, be doing a lot of underburning, you know, of their investment out there, uh, but they can come in full, full bore uh, on site preparation and getting some of the fuels out of the landscape that drive these kind, this kind of fire behavior. That's going to be the, their chance uh, to contribute to this landscape level fire flow. The root of the problem, and it's already been mentioned a couple times, is this, this you know, human psyche. Uh, issue And so I was part of this group that worked on coupled human and natural systems kind of grant uh, where we not only did the physical fire behavior modeling but also kind of the, the social science side of it through surveys and focus groups and all to get at, you know, largely uh, twofold. One is, you know, how did we get to the system that we have now? Uh, and the second part was, you know, how can it change going into the future? And so this, this is that, that first part of how did we get to where we are now? And we started this diagram really with wildfire at the center and decided ultimately to change it to human vulnerability to that fire at the center. And that's, that's when we realized through all this work uh, that almost everything that we do out there right now makes the problem worse. Almost everything, even the fuels treatment. So if we go in there and, and reduce the hazardous fuels treatments, uh, let's see if I can get it here. There you go. Uh, so even, even these times that we do hazardous fuels treatments uh, or are successful suppressing or all that kind of stuff, all that does ultimately is feed back into expansion into the wild and urban interface or accumulation of fuels on the landscape that ultimately just drives more human vulnerability to the wildfire out there. Everything we do currently ultimately makes the problem worse. And the sociologist and the medical community have a word for this. It's called pathology, <laughs> social pathology. Because we know it, we know that putting out this, this fire under very modest weather conditions when it's really easy to run out there and put it out. Uh, we know that, that, that putting it out ultimately is going to be bad for us, but it's our job. And, you know, it's what we do, it's what we're expected to do, and, and uh, interestingly enough, we often feel really good about it that we put this fire out. Uh, when ultimately it's going to be worse next week, next month, or next year. So this is going to be a human psyche thing that we're going to need to, to get around as well. And so I think what will help us do that is to first just embrace this fact uh, that the reservoir is sitting out there and that it will, that it will drain. And, you know, it's, it's going to drain. And so the question becomes, you know, how, when, under what circumstances do you want to lower that water level, the biomass that has already accumulated behind this reservoir, uh, how can we do it most safely and efficiently? What the difference between the wildland urban interface uh, and you know, and the broader landscape, and, and how that plays in together? Uh, and I think the most exciting is how can we connect that thinking and that inevitability of it burning? How can we connect it to all the other interests that we have out there? The wildland, um, the the wildlife habitat, uh, the watersheds. The, the need for timber, fiber, biofuel, uh, carbon credits, you know, whatever it is, how can we knit all of that together so that we're just remembering that this landscape is also fuels in addition to all these other things that we're interested in. So here's the conceptual framework for it uh, to, to help us think about you know, what we're going to do and how we're going to integrate it. Uh, so fire happens on this spectrum from where it just first starts happening under the lowest conditions, the lowest amount of energy input. Uh, output from it where we have enough output that the next particle is ignited and that you actually get fire spread uh, all the way up uh, to the very worst uh, conditions you know right up in in this part of it so here's where fire barely burns uh, and this this of course is where I like to do prescribed burning because it's least likely to get away from me and I get to, I have the most 
uh, regulatory ability over how much consumption I'm getting and how much heat I'm producing and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then all the way up in this part of it is where we get into the area where you know all of our uh, attack strategies and everything are, are pointless uh, as well. But fire happens over this entire this entire gradient. It's good on that. So what is that in the 1900s suppression model that we now live with now had great success at in the, under the low and modest conditions uh, and now routinely uh, failing, actually has always failed at those highest intensities. Uh, but now we're just getting more and more occurrences of those higher intensities overlapped with the fuel accumulation that we have. And, we're, and that's why the acreages are going up, uh, the acreages of high severity are going up, uh, the expenses that we put into fire suppression are going up as, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, prescribed burning, we do a little bit of prescribed burning uh, right down in, under the lowest conditions. And the, actually even the ecological effectiveness of that kind of burning uh, we, could, we could pull in, into question. Uh, here. Uh, so this pathology, uh, therefore, that we have just kicks the can down the road. Uh, all it does is force the, you know, everything, uh, all of the burning, uh, we're, we put it out, we put it out down here, it just kicks everything to the acres are going to burn under these conditions. I mean, by definition, that, that, is, that is what this suppression model does. Unless you assume it's not going to burn in the future. Uh, so, it, is, is anyone thinking that we're not going to have wildland fire in the future? Good. So all we're doing is kicking it down to that part of the spectrum, right? So a only as needed kind of suppression model uh, because, yeah, next to the hospital, next to the school or whatever, you know, we're always going to be in suppression, in suppression mode unless we just prescribe burned it. Uh, last month, in which case it's, it, it, it can't burn and, and we don't even have to su suppress it. Uh, but here under, <clears throat> so we, you know, we would still have successful suppression uh, under the low and modest uh, conditions. We'll skip the high conditions for now. And really what we need to do is at the, you know, at, at, under these kind of conditions, do a lot more of the prescribed burning or appropriate fire, appropriate fire, something, yeah, fire use. Uh, kinds, kinds of things for when we have natural ignitions or, or just ignitions uh, under those conditions that we like when and where they are in time and space that they can actually do some good uh, for us. Uh, if we do that, then uh, the, that's the only chance we have to be not kicking the can down the road and be able to move from it being outright failure during those worst weather conditions to getting success. Because remember, those fires are going to happen anyway. They're beyond our ability uh, to alter their flow. Uh, our only chance is that the weather changes, uh, which will eventually happen, uh, or it encounters an area that burned last week, last month, last year, five years ago where the fire behavior will change drastically. And it's really interesting within the fire community, uh, and there's a certain number of you here, you know, you know that last month, last year, or that burn even three years ago, that's, your, that's an anchor point. That's, that might be your safety zone even for evacuating to. But you have to remember that this fire that's burning right now is next month's anchor point and next month's safety zone, and next year's anchor point, and next year's safety zone. That's how these things fit together in time and space. So you've got to think about whether or not you put this one out, because this is your investment in the future. Mechanics of how to do that. That's where this fire shed concept comes into place. Uh, you know, recognizing that these large fire sheds will burn, uh, so uh, O'Connor et al. Uh, mapped out just in wildfires in southern Idaho, um, where, where we typically uh, had the fires, having fires stop uh, in the landscape, you know, as, as they burned out. And, and you know, it's, it's ridge tops, it's large road systems, uh, it's rivers, lakes, oceans, you know, those kinds of things become the boundaries of our large fire events historically. 
Uh, and, and anyone that's, that's fought fire, you, you look for these things as you're modeling out fire behavior and thinking about where you're going to construct line uh, and all. So that, that exists. That's very straightforward. Uh, we can do those kind of analyses in advance based on past wildland fire, but we can be even more proactive with that. And so um, Chris Dunn and some others uh, uh, from the Missoula Fire Lab have been working on this concept of, of planning them in advance uh, and having a catalog of response, um, you know, uh, planned operational delineations is the pod. So you know, now you know why I put money uh, in planned operational delineations. Uh, and this, this is the, these are the delineations that we're going to use in the actual wildfire response mode. So, so Chris took this example, landscape from Western Oregon, complex ownership, all that kind of stuff. You can see perhaps uh, all the little black lines uh, and roads that are in there. And simplified to the major road networks, particularly on ridge tops. Uh, and chunked it up into one and two and some three or four thousand hectare blocks. Uh, and did an analysis that showed five to seven percent uh, needed to be added boundaries. So the existing road networks and, and all that kind of stuff provided 90 some percent of your planned future delineations that you're going to need. You would need to construct a little bit additional to kind of knit it together into these. 2,000 hectare uh, planned blocks uh, out there. Uh, and he, he had done this ignition bef um, uh, before the Douglas Complex fire uh, happened. And so the C Douglas Complex fire came through and dropped 180 some ignitions in that part of the country. Uh, 13, no, 23 or so of them are here in this picture um, out there. Yeah, you could, they project up there uh, pretty well. Uh, and of course, the, there was a su suppression response right away, but it was on both sides of the valley, the Douglas, uh, the Douglas County Fire Protection Association uh, was, was overwhelmed with how, you know, how many directions uh, they needed to go and all. So some of these, some of these fires, uh, they, some of those ignition points they didn't get to. Uh, and so for about two days, uh, the ones that they didn't get to uh, advanced. Uh, and became part of the Douglas uh, complex. Uh, the red color uh, is high severity, you know, near stand replacing fire and or stand replacing fire. And by the 30th of July, uh, the weather had changed, uh, but at that point, uh, despite spending a million dollars a day, uh, you know, all, all we could do was try to keep that fire contained uh, out there. Uh, the, and the reason to, to show this progression to you uh, is, you know, how much after the first couple days, how little high severity fire there is, uh, that uh, the terrain was rugged enough that uh, we, could, we couldn't get into a lot of those areas. We dug some new line, but we did a lot of backfiring from existing road systems and from rivers and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and a lot of that backfiring, you know, made on the fly at two o'clock in, in the morning kind of decisions about how to respond to this fire actually matches up to the pre-planned delineations that we had because they were the major road systems and ridge tops uh, and those kinds of things. And so what this does, you know, ultimately with the fi final fire uh, perimeter, uh, once, once it built, built out, uh, is that you know there are a few areas where there's some difference uh, between you know what we would have planned in advance. This was some new constructed line right down through here that we actually we could argue that it might have been better to do this and have back, backfire from here and saved the ecological damage and all associated uh, with you know this dozer line that came down that ridge. But a whole lot of the boundary in both parts uh, of this matched up to what could have been pre-planned uh, delineations and all to it. Uh, and those, those are areas that tie to all the other things that we do as land managers uh, in terms of wildlife and watershed and road maintenance and all those kinds of things could have been folded in if we'd have been thinking about those delineations. That kind of work could have been folded into the routine, low cost, actually some of them could have yielded money you know, some of the fuels treatments along these planned delineations could have yielded money uh, rather than doing them in, cris in crisis mode uh, at, you know, eight in the morning, a million dollars a day, 
uh, you know, it, using fire camp people to brush roads and, and all of those kinds of things. We can just have a more planned, uh, less expensive, cohesive, integrated strategy uh, into thinking, if we think about the inevitability of, of the fire, we can just think about it differently, do these things much more efficiently into the, in going into the future. Uh, and the ecological impact would be different uh, because a, a lot of this kind of burning these days uh, was all when the weather conditions weren't, weren't too bad and we were, we were backfiring. Uh, that, that is a wide range, that, that whole part of that spectrum from low to high, most of it, four out of five days are good burning days, are, are non-problematic uh, burning days. And we can, we can do a lot of prescribed burning during those within our planned delineations. We can do it in the, those four days rather than always kicking the can down the road to that fifth day uh, when we're burning at severities that we don't think. Would, would benefit our landscape. So that's uh, zooming in on you know, some of this first day kind of fire behavior and looking at the percentage more than 50% stand replacing fire. Uh, yeah, that, that is the problem and that, that's, that's what we can largely avoid. Uh, and yes, it's, it's a big lift uh, you know, emotionally for often for us individually and within our agencies and the cultures uh, within our agencies to think this way and, and, and to think about um, this idea of planning and burning, actively, proactively burning, not waiting for them to happen, proactively burning uh, these fire sheds. It's, it's a big lift, but I'm going to remind you, they're going to burn anyway. They are going to burn anyway. Your favorite area to hunt or camp or hike or to look at, it's going to burn. And yeah, maybe I'm the first person to tell you that. Okay. But I'm telling you, it's not gonna necessarily be in your lifetime, but it's gonna burn. It's gonna burn. Uh, keeping keeping the, the 1990s paradigm, the old thinking way, uh, all that does is, is ensure that a larger percentage of it is gonna burn under, you know, in that fifth day. You know, those high severity, the 80th, upper 80th and 90th percentile kinds of conditions. You know, that's, nobody wins when we always kick the fire down uh, the road to those, those kinds of conditions. So beyond just acknowledging that those are going to burn, uh, remembering that you know, most, of the, most of the ignitions, even the natural ignitions, are happening in parts of the fire season that are very good prescribed burning conditions. Uh, so you know, let's, let's get in prescribed burning mode. So even as part of our suppression strategy, uh, we can uh, we can do prescribed burning. Have a prescribed burner or two on every in every incident command structure that you have for doing that for doing that backfire. Uh, for every helicopter with a water bucket, you have one with a hella torch as well for doing the back burning. Uh, last month's you know fire is is this month's you know fuel break, uh, and you know so each time we burn successfully burn off 2,000 hectares or so we can update our landscape level containment strategy uh, and get it on the docket to to burn the burn so a lot of the fire examples and all that that i use now uh, burned 10 and 15 years ago uh, and by golly we're, we're still going in and suppressing fire it's not a fuel problem at all it won't be a fuel problem for another couple decades but we're still going in there and suppressing every lightning strike uh, out there. It's like, why? It's not going to go anywhere. It's only going to do ecological good at this point. Well, no, let's kick it down the road, let all the fuels accumulate again, and burn under those conditions. So, you know, it's, it's going to happen. We have more behavioral tools and predictability than we've ever had. Yeah, we messed up. These, these systems used to be resistant and resilient. Yeah, we screwed it up. My predecessors lied to you. I'm sorry. Get over it. <laughs> you know, this past, the fire ecology, traditional ecological knowledge kinds of things can guide how we're going to move uh, into the future. Uh, you know, we, we've adapted to other things. We can adapt uh, to the smoke and the flames and all uh, as well. So, and that's going to be adaptive management. It's going to be collaboratives like you're, you're like you're working on now. And we, you know, we've got to, it starts with just recognizing the change. So thanks. Let's get a drip torch in Smokey's hands and get out there and do the work.